Hello and welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner with Karen Sharp Price. This podcast will inform and inspire you in your quest to find the right career path. If you're just starting out, looking to make a change in your field, or transitioning into a new career, then this podcast is for you. We will take a look at different careers, companies, and opportunities. You will hear success stories from professionals in all career paths, and so much more. You will leave this podcast with three key takeaways that you can easily put into practice. Enjoy! Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening to Sharp HR Career Corner. We have a great episode for you today. Before I tell you about our guest, I want to give you a little backstory on how we came to meet. A couple of years ago, my son came to my husband and I and told us that he's really interested in blacksmithing. Honestly, when I first heard it, my thoughts went immediately to Little House on the Prairie in the old Western movies with blacksmiths. But I wasn't even sure that blacksmithing was still even around. Then, shortly after our conversation with our son, I saw my husband and my son walking down the street with a big double grill. Now, for a brief second, I thought my husband had been listening to me because I had been complaining earlier that we needed a bigger grill. But I quickly learned that the intention for this grill was to turn it into a forge for my son so that he could start to blacksmith. The two of them tinkered around with it, and they got it working, and my son would look up knives on the internet, he'd trace them out, and then he'd work on making them with his forge. He did this on and off for about a year or more. You know, he kept talking about blacksmithing, he'd watch YouTube videos, and he created his knives and tongs, and he continued to show a real interest. Now you have to understand, I'm a career coach, and clients come to me all the time wanting to get into different careers. They try and figure out what careers would best fit them. So if I can't help my own son figure out how to get into blacksmithing, or at least learn as much as he can about it so that he can make an educated decision on whether he wants to pursue this or not, how can I help my clients? And this particular career was going to be a challenge, or at least I thought. Meanwhile, I'm on LinkedIn uh, pretty much every day, and I belong to a number of groups. One group had a question circulating from one of the members asking, if you had a child interested in a trade, would you support them in that path? I responded back and said that I actually had a 14-year-old son who was interested in blacksmithing, but I was having a hard time finding resources. All of a sudden, another member responded back to me, and they sent me a link to colleges in the U.S. that offer blacksmithing. Couldn't believe that there was actually a list already created. So, after I learned about the colleges, I continued to think about ways to learn more about it for my son. I talked to a lot of people in all different industries and all different career paths. And a few months went by, I was meeting with someone and I mentioned to them that I was trying to find information about blacksmithing. She told me about an article that her sister had done on a local blacksmith in Buffalo area and if I wanted, she would give me his contact information. I was like, absolutely. I went home that day, went on LinkedIn, and I just couldn't wait. I was so excited to learn that someone in the area was doing this. I found him, he was on LinkedIn, I hit the connect button, and I waited. He actually responded really fast. I then wrote him a message telling him about my son and asking if he would mind just talking to him about it. He said, oh, absolutely, he talked to him about it, and he'd also invited us to visit his workshop and show us what he does. While we were there, he gave us a ton of information about associations, clubs, local, national, a school in Rochester that you take classes at. He showed us the tools that he uses, the tools that he's made for himself, the forges that he has. It it was incredible. He couldn't have been nicer to my son. And I can't even come close to describing to you how my son was feeling after he left that workshop that day. He was so ready to learn more and to do more forging. So we got home, we got on the computer, and we looked up the school in Rochester. I wrote to the executive director, and she wrote back. He had to fill out an application because of his age, and he had to be interviewed by the executive director to get permission to actually take a class. Week went by. I found that information out. I printed out the application. My son came home from school. I told him about it. He sat down that day, and he completed the application form. We scheduled an interview for him, went to Rochester, went in, was interviewed. The interview took almost an hour and a half. I was really impressed for a 14-year-old kid. He was super engaged. He was permitted to sign up for classes after his interview. And now he's already taken his first private lesson and he absolutely loved it. And he plans on taking more classes. 
If it wasn't for my guest today, we would never have made so much progress in learning about blacksmithing. This has all happened since the beginning of November when I first reached out to him on LinkedIn. So now you can understand why I'm so excited to actually talk to our blacksmith today. My guest's career began as a welder and a fabricator in the early 90s, but it wasn't until 2001 when he found his true calling as a craftsman. The first time he swung a hammer and struck hot metal, he knew it was love. From that experience was born an unrelenting urge to create using fire and metal. From concept to design to creation, all projects crafted at his forge are intended to contain not only distinct physical beauty, but an experience for the client that is not found in mass-produced items. Each part of every project is individually forged with attention to detail and exceptional craftsmanship. The future for Arc Iron Creations is based on forging relationships within the community. The continual expansion of knowledge and skill in his craft and the ability to create story and conversational pieces for his clients for the years to come. Please welcome my guest, Andrew Chambers, from Arc Iron Creations. Thank you so much for being here today. Sure thing. I have noticed that over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about trades. And in fact, there's such a huge need uh, really across the board. But they don't have enough students interested and even in the pipeline to learn those trades. Unfortunately, there still seems to be a stigma attached to it. Do you have any suggestions to sort of turn that around or get more kids involved? Shop class in schools was always a big thing in the past. From what I can see now, that's been cut back a lot. I think you need to get students doing hands-on work and get involved in different areas. Make it okay. It used to be that people got pushed into the trades because they thought, you know, just the people who weren't smart enough to go to college went to the trades. And that that's not true at all. That That's a, a huge item of misinformation that's out there. Every skill needs intelligent people involved in it. So I think that they need to identify the kids that just might not be interested in going down the career path of college. Not everyone's going to be a doctor. There's going to be people who are going to go into fields of welding or plumbing, mechanic work. They're going to run their own businesses. It isn't just the people who aren't smart enough to go become doctors just go to blue collar fields. But they definitely need to build interest and let it be known from a young age that it's okay to do that kind of stuff. That there's a need for it also. You know, that's why I ended up down the, the road that I did is I think I had that in me. Like, I just want to make things. And yeah. I think that some people are just born with, maybe people have it and they don't realize it too. And it needs to be brought out of them. So, yeah. you know, maybe in schools, a better approach than just saying like, here's the project you're going to do would be to work on some skills and then let, let the students come up with their own projects and Create you might even own. see more creativity come out of that. That's really what the trades are about. It's like figuring out how to do it the right way. Some of it would just be working. And if you're a welder, you just got to figure out how to become good at what you do. But if you're going to do something more down the line of what I'm doing, the blacksmithing, you don't always want to follow a program path. You need to be able to come up with your own. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about how did you start? When you were in school, middle school, high school, did you know that this is something that you had an interest in? My father was self-employed and owned a welding shop, and he started it. I mean, he owned it from the time I was born. You know, at a very young age, myself and my brother, who's only 15 months younger than I am, would go to work for him. Very young, eight, nine years old. And he'd have us do crazy stuff, like whatever was around to do. But then as we got a little older, he just continued to come up with various businesses, like we had a wood splitting business. And so that was what we did. We, we went to the shop after school and we split firewood and stacked it and then delivered it to people's houses. So, you know, you get good at doing things with your hands, doing yep. that. And then whatever jobs he had in the shop, welding jobs, whatever there was that we could do on them, we would do. And then he purchased a bicycle shop and we worked, sold bicycles wow. and worked on bicycles. And he still had the welding shop all this time. Uh-huh. And we, we would play around in the welding shop, too. So we always had things that, that we could do, but it was building skills that whole time. you know. And then, and then I worked as an auto mechanic for my uncle, who was in the same building that we were in. My father owned the building, and he rented the shop from him. And then went and worked as a, uh, a welder for a friend of my father's and really learned to fabricate from that guy. He was really, really, really good. He taught me like everything I know now about fabrication. 
So I had a lot of advantage and help as I went through it. But I think just going down that path built up my interest in coming to the point where I am now. And also a large interest in art and music as a child. And I think that helped. I always wanted to create. So like drawing or what Draw, kind of... Drawing, okay. I drew constantly oh, okay. um, as a kid. Every back in the day, we had to have the paper bag covers on all of our books. Yes, Mine yes. all had album covers drawn ah, on them, you know, because okay. that's what I spent my time doing. Yeah. I loved art class. I always did well in it. It was something I really enjoyed, so... And then what about the music? What um, type of music did you do when as a kid? Well, <laughs> as, a kid, as a kid, I listened to a lot of heavy metal, <laughs> um, but I played guitar from a young age as a teenager. You know, I think all those things go hand in hand, mm-hmm. music and art and creativity. But then expanded my horizons. I took, you know, music theory class in high school. And in that class, the teacher made us listen to, you know, music that would get us out of our comfort zone, a lot of classical music. And I became a lover of that. And then cool. in that class, he also made us study because he believe that music and art went together. He made us study artists. So one day a week, we would study a different artist and okay. we had a, a notebook full of all these artists. And it, you know, it gave me a love of art, painting. An appreciation and, you know, Absolutely. Of it. Maybe it was a perfect storm that got me to the point where I was, but I really, really enjoyed that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't, I didn't start creating with metal until later on, but I built skills up at that point. So when you were in high school, did you think that you would get out of high school and then work for your dad? Or what What were you thinking about at that um, point? I assumed at that point that, that I might. Uh, I went, like I said, I went to work after high school, right after high school for his friend that was a fabricator. And I kind of floundered around. I worked for a few people that he knew, actually. Uh, did various things, some of them that I liked, some that I didn't. But every one of the jobs that I had, um, all of them were always skilled labor type of jobs, uh, blue collar type jobs, Uh but I built up more skill and knowledge of the things that I was doing or maybe what I did or didn't like to do. I was working for a friend of his who kind of was getting slow and and we had uh, the opportunity to get a welding contract that we had done before. I did it while working for the friend of my father's and he had shut down his shop and we got the opportunity to do that. And from there, it was like we worked together from then on. And I was probably... 20 years old at that point, maybe 21 years old. So we started out with this contract as uh, the smallest vendor for this company. And they were a local company that built car carrier tractor trailers Okay, and ended up being their biggest subcontractor. So we went from just me doing work to having like 20 people work on the line. That was like, you know, 15 years of doing it later. So we went went for a long time. We are going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about how The welding piece turned into the blacksmithing interest. We'll be right back with Andrew Chambers from Arc Iron Creations. Have you been working in the same career for years, but you're just not that excited anymore about what you do? Would you love to try something new, but don't know if you can or even know how to begin? Contact Sharp Human Resources. We will help you take those first few steps, point you in the right direction, and guide you along the way. Welcome back to Sharp HR Career Corner. We're here talking to Andrew Chambers about welding, fabrication, and blacksmithing. So one question I need to ask you is, what is the difference between a welder and a fabricator? Welding is the physical act of bonding metal together, you know, be it stick welding or TIG welding. There's all, all kinds of various kinds of welding. Okay. Uh, fabrication is the art of building um, things. So most fabricators would be welders, but not all welders would be fabricators. You, know, you could have a welder that just specifically works at one spot in a shop and he's just provided pieces and he puts them together, but maybe he's not fabricating off of a, a specific drawing. So, so he doesn't know what the big picture is. Possibly. He's just doing one Possibly. piece of that picture. Correct. Okay. What I'd like to know is how do you go from working with a friend, um, having maybe 20 people working for you, then getting into like blacksmithing how, how do you go from welding to blacksmith so it was it was my father not not, a, not it was uh, so oh, it was your father it was my father so he was he was actually owned the business so we built these car hauler tractor trailers through the years probably from the age of 20 up until 27 i would make various art pieces out of metal uh, i had a friend who did custom motorcycles and he did some work on mine okay. and i built him some stands that had like crazy metal skull faces on the bottoms of them for an auto show he put his motorcycles in. Okay. And uh, they were just, you know, to hold the ropes around him so people didn't get at him. Oh, you yeah, know, various yeah. little things like that. Okay. And then 
around the age of 27, I found an anvil that was in our shop. I, I kind of knew it existed, and I started heating metal up and playing around with it, and it, it was like immediate. Like, I was drawn to that. The company that we had the contract for that built the tractor trailers, Mm -hmm. they would go on shutdown all the time. So we would have these periods of time when I just had time. There was really not a ton of stuff to do, but Uh when they ramped, we always knew they would come back around. And so we had, you know, kind of had to be ready. And when we were working for them, it was like pedal to the metal. Like there was like no time to do anything else. But in those down times, I started playing around with with blacksmithing and like fell in love with it immediately and started making up little art items and doing shows around Buffalo, like, you know, like the little art shows. And I would take pieces and, you know, make like plant hangers and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and sell them, but all handmade stuff. You know, you look back and you go like, I can't believe I made that stuff back then. But (laughs) at the time, you know, you're like, you made it. It was like really, really cool. Yeah. It was really exciting. And, um, I started looking around on like online and I found a blacksmithing class um, down by uh, Pittsburgh at this school called Touchstone Center for Arts. And I went and took it and it was a week long. It was like adult summer camp. It was like the coolest thing ever. It was, there was so much creativity there. And I just, I had a great time in class. The teacher, uh, his name was Jim Hoffman. He became a very good friend of mine. We still talk to this day. He's an incredible blacksmith. And I learned a ton in just that one week from him. And I came back and I had a job. It was the first railing I ever built. And I had no power tools. It was all just me and a forge and a hammer. And I built a new forge when I came back because I had seen one that he had built. Uh And I stood at my anvil for eight, ten hours a day working on this railing, just working on my hammering technique and getting good at doing blacksmithing techniques, you know, which are completely different than welding and fabricating techniques. You know, having the welding and fabricating background is huge. Helped. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Monster for for doing what I do now. And it, it was it. I fell in love. Like it was, that was like, I was heading that direction. So I made it my goal to, to just study ironwork, you know, get, I bought books on, you know, all the handmade ironwork. There's all kinds of stuff that's out there. Right. Just started creating more and more stuff. So at what point then did you start um, Arc Iron Creations? Uh, I started a very early, like right around 2002 or early 2003, because I, I wanted to put it together as a, a business to do the shows, the art show. In order to do those shows, you have to have a tax number. In order yeah. to have a tax number, you have to have a business. So, Boy, looking um, back, yeah. you know, I probably have met you. I've probably going to those different art shows. Very possibly. Yeah, we used to and do didn't know. numerous ones around Buffalo. 100 huh. Craftsmen up in Lockport okay. uh, at Keenan Center and... There are all sorts of small local ones. I only yeah. did um, Allentown one time. Okay. We used to, you know, three or four times a year, we would go do shows. So and, now... Uh, my wife got sick of that early on. Really? Because, yes, because everything was so heavy. Yes, She, she says true. that she's going to marry a pillow maker in her next life, you know, so... <laughs> Were you still doing the welding when you started art? Yes. So um, we still had that contract going on. I would spend my days welding and, you know, I had a great advantage that we already had a shop. Mm-hmm. So I just put my blacksmithing area in one corner of the building. We we're in. You've been in my building. Right, it's right. Large it was building. Great. It's a large yes. building. You could, and we we often now um, comment that you could probably land a plane. Yeah, <laughs> that's been said before. Yeah, yeah. It's a big building, and so I put my blacksmithing shop in a, the back corner of the building, and that was where at you know after I was done doing the welding work that I had to do, I would go work on the projects that I had back there. And a friend of my brother in law's who was building a house on, on Grand Island, and that was the first railing I ever built. Huh. And then my brother-in-law built a giant house, and I did, like, all the iron work in the house, which wow. was great because a lot of people don't get that opportunity. You need to have a portfolio of work to go convince someone, you know, someone to let you build stuff for their house. Right. And he saw that he felt I had the talent to do it, and he's like, let's let's go. And I came up with designs and built railings and his dining room table and their front door iron work and all kinds of stuff. So that was really cool. So when you said, you know, you went somewhere and you went, spent a week mm-hmm. learning more about it, and that was in the very beginning, how many more things have you done like that? Or is it just practice, practice, practice? It was it was a lot of practice for me when I came back, you know, because you're at 27 years old. I had just gotten married, had a house. It wasn't like I could go spend six months in an apprenticeship somewhere. Right. I, I, had to, I had to keep working. Yeah. But the blacksmithing... To me, it felt like it came relatively naturally, and I just worked at continually coming up with 
my own designs for things and making new pieces for the shows or just mm-hmm. something that I wanted to make. I very rarely like would do a project that I saw the project. I, I wanted to come up with my own stuff. You so know? you actually are drawing the things uh, first. Like if someone comes to you and says, I want this done, if that's all they've got, <laughs> then you go and you kind of come up with some ideas and then sit down with them and have them look at it and decide what they like, what they don't. Definitely. And, you know, usually it'll have a conversation of, do you have something or some idea of a style you like? But a lot of people don't even know what like the different styles of ironwork are at this point. There's definitely been a resurgence in blacksmithing. And, you know, some people do have an idea what they're looking for, but a lot of people mm-hmm. don't. There was a decline in blacksmithing for a big part of the 20th century. It kind of died out. Uh, one of the guys that used to work for me brought in a blacksmithing book that he had gotten in high school. So mm. they still taught oh, blacksmithing wow. up to a certain point in shop classes in high school. My and, son would love that. <laughs> and I, I know. They should do it. They should still do it now. Uh-huh. But with the advent of machinery, ironwork became all machine made and you could buy decorative pieces out of catalogs and weld it together. And there's still a big industry that does that. The art of hand forging kind of really declined and it became fewer and fewer and fewer And then in in the 1970s, there was kind of this rebirth of it. This group of people started Abana um, in the United States, um, the American Artist Blacksmith Association of North America, started to surge up again in the United States. Now, in Europe, you could still take blacksmithing apprenticeships. I know blacksmiths that did that in Europe. Even now to this day, they still have that. So it really didn't die out there the way that it did here. But now there's been a big resurgence here and there's a decent amount. I wouldn't say it's like a flooded market, you know, but there's things that have helped, you know, recent times, you know, like uh, Forged in Fire, everyone watches that. And anyone I talk to, you know, like, oh, I watched Forged in Fire. (laughs) Uh And, you know, while it's not really real, it's gotten people interested in it, which I think is cool. For my son, he just went to YouTube and found videos He just started watching them. I don't think at the time that he came across them that he had any idea about it, but it really fascinated him. Absolutely. Something fascinating about hitting hot metal. Yeah. It's almost impossible to me to to think that someone could do it and not be like, that's really cool, right? Mm -hmm. And just want to continue to do it. The biggest thing, you know, at the beginning is, especially when I see people start now, is pushing through till you can get to the point where you're you're good at it because there's a huge learning curve to right. it and it takes time. It takes, it takes practice. We've had parts of this conversation, you know, 10,000 sure. hour rule, right? You know, you have to just continually do it. something until yep. you're skilled enough at it that you can just create what you want. Now that I see what my son has done it is interesting. The fact that when he's around it and he's doing it, he's so intent that it, it, it's really, it's nice to actually, you know, see that. Yeah, in absolutely. Him. That's at great. 14. So we talked earlier about how your dad pre- Pretty much kind of got you working really early on. He, he did. Let's back up for a second. Yeah. Here, so you just said at 14 years old. So this is why if we go back to the, what we talked about at the beginning, this is why we need to get kids that age interest. At 14, he knows that this is something that really, really interests him. He really him. likes so it. So our school should be working at that. Finding out, you know, what some of these kids are interested in. I have, I know this is a little bit of a segue. I yeah, have right. a kid that's been coming to my shop, high school student, two days a week, mm-hmm. like an internship. I didn't even know that existed. He called me up out of the blue. Uh, or his teacher did, and said, yeah. you know, listen, he's in a special program at Kenmore that does this with kids. Yeah, that's great. And they can go places, and he, they, he comes to my shop. He can do anything I want him to do. So I've got him doing all kinds of stuff. So he has a full experience, right. you know, like forging or whatever, cutting on the saw or drilling or whatever he needs to do. But when he walks away at the end of this year, he's going to know what it's like to have been in a shop. I think that's, a, I think there's a whole bunch of kids out there that would jump at that opportunity. Oh, I do too. And I I don't think they even know it exists. No. They know the plumber and they know the carpenter, welder, but blacksmithing, you know, not a lot of do. My son has a friend who's now interested in it because he's he's seen what he's doing. Sure, sure. But even all those other things you mentioned, there are kids that might want to go do that too. Yeah. I don't know the path. There's a huge need for all of that. My husband, he's very hands-on, so he, you know, if something breaks, he wants to fix it. And, yeah. And if he doesn't know how to, he looks it up and he listens to YouTube videos and he, you know, he becomes the expert in whatever he needs to do. So my son has kind of grown up. If he doesn't know how to do it, he'll look it up and he'll figure it out. And well, then, you know, and I think that's how you did it. Now, yeah. Right. We didn't. We didn't have that years and years ago. You know, even when I started, that was that didn't really exist yet. You know, and now it does. Now yes. there's three or four really really good people on YouTube that are like actually teaching blacksmith. They'll go through and show you how they made something mm-hmm. step by step, and they're very good. They learn the techniques, and, and then when they can actually go and actually try it and see that they can do it. 
it just brings it right home and they want to do it more. I do think that across the board, trades aren't talked about enough. People don't know where to go. Being a career coach, yes, my son threw a curveball at me when he said he wanted to be a blacksmith and I really didn't know, you know what to do with that. But I started talking to people, just having conversations. And Buffalo's small. People know everybody. People knew you. And it's just amazing to me how he has moved so quickly in a very short period of time just by knocking on somebody's door, asking questions, learning about it, and having somebody to ask those questions to, I think, is the most important thing. Sure, um, sure. And if you don't get your questions answered, keep keep asking. That's it. You know, right. you got to find the right people. Right. And then he's discovered more than just me, right? You know, yeah, I mean, but through you, know. you, then he moved on to something else. That's the key is don't be afraid if you have a, if you have an interest to try to do as much as you can to get some information, get resources. Oh, absolutely. Um, Any young person now, you have the advantage is huge, right? Everyone's yeah, got a we computer have in their hand. Like it's easy to email or text somebody, whatever, you know, you can you can find answers to your questions. And one of the things I think that I learned from you, you are the type of person that really wants to continue to learn. You learned welding, you were interested in blacksmithing, you figured out where you needed to go and what you needed to do to try to improve that, but you are really a true self-learner. Absolutely. And, and I think that one of the things that I try to let people know is even after you've gone to school, the learning doesn't stop. Ever. But, but the great part is, is that the learning becomes what you're interested in. All of elementary, all of middle school, high school, you're sort of directed as to what your options are. And they're very limited to begin with. In high school, they open up a little bit. But once you get out, you kind of create your path. That's right. Now the world is so much bigger. There's so many people out there that know how to do all these different things. For you, self-learning is not just about blacksmithing. So when you're interested in anything, you really... As much as I can, I want to learn yourself about at it. it. Absolutely. I want to read as much as I can about it. I want to experience whatever it is. I'm the kind... Like, I just have always felt like there's no point in doing something unless you're going to know as much as you can about it. Again, you go back to we have the ability now to, like really delve into things. You know, if you want to find someone out there doing something, it's it's not that hard to find them. Also. No, no, um, I've learned that. <laughs> but, but but absolutely, no. And I think that's a I think that's a huge part of life is just continuing to educate yourself. You know, never stop. Always keep the, your brain working. Figure out how to do as much stuff as you can. When our parents were working, they picked an area of interest and they pretty much were going to stay in that area for the rest of their lives. Right. Their career was going to be their career. And now for students, they need to think about five years out instead of 50 years out what they plan on doing because they're not going to work for one company for the rest of their life. Likely not. No. Right, and, right. and their career is probably not going to be the same career over time. Correct. And you really have taken that welding and turned it into other things. Right. Probably still have more ideas to come in the future. I do. And not all of them are related to exactly that. I mean, you have to you have to figure out what the things you're going to be able to do to, to survive through through life. Are, pay, right? pay know, bills pay, and things like pay that. Pay the bills, yeah. right. You got to pay your bills. Yeah. So you know, I look at the skills that I've built up as just a part of that. And then and there's more to it in the future. But, and there's um, stepping stones. Absolutely. Because the things that you learned in welding really were helpful for blacksmithing. Super helpful. Yeah. Know? And I think that was a giant advantage to be able to have done that and become so proficient at it. Even though I'm a, a blacksmith, I still consider myself a professional fabricator also. Yeah. And that is still part of my business, too. Mm -hmm. I would never want to say I don't do that anymore because people need that done. So we still do stuff for local companies in that area. Yeah, I think that it's building and building and expanding, expanding your knowledge. And, you know, if you're working for someone... Don't stop expanding the knowledge of the thing. Continue to educate yourself. Don't just sit idle and not better yourself because there might come a day that you need to know how to do something else. Younger people, when they're working, will job hop a lot because they say they're not growing and they're not learning what they thought they were going to. The person themselves has to show the interest and they can't just depend on the company that they're working for to do it for them. And right. I think when I look at resumes and I see that people job hop, their reasons are, well, you know, I didn't get out of it what I thought I was going to, or I didn't grow as much. Some of it falls back on them. They need to do that. Right. And some of it is don't be impatient either. You know, sometimes it takes, takes time. being patient and time, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Nothing, things don't happen immediately. Well, like, what is it? 10,000? 10,000 hours. 10,000 <laughs> yeah. hours, right? Uh, I mean, there's a book about that. 
any skill takes that. To you become know, you, really good at what you to, do. That's it. To become like so good at it that you almost can't remember being bad at it. If you aren't going to dedicate the time to something, then you're just not going to, you're not going to progress the way that you think you're going to progress, right? right? There's progressing in your mind, the idea of doing it, but yeah. then there's the actual action of going and doing it. And if it's something like this, it's going to take work, a lot, yeah, a lot of it. A lot and, of uh, it. Yeah. Patience and time. That's it. If someone is listening to us right now and they've been thinking about going out on their own, starting their own business, what do you wish you knew before going out and starting our Iron Creations? Is there anything that stands out to you? I wish that I would have been better at business before I went out and started it. I did not go to college. If I could go back now, I would love to have gone for some form of business. When you're running your own business, you're, you're the everything. You know, everyone sees people running your own business. They're like, oh, that must be great. I mean, it Take is. Take long and, and, lunches. And, uh, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. But, you know, you're still working for somebody. You know, it is. It's just you're not working for a corporation or, or a company at that point. You're, you're working for your client. Everyone that gives me work expects that I do that work. You have to go about getting it done. But I wish I would have known how to how to sell myself and my work better at the beginning. That was hard. I think it was just in my nature to second guess myself a little bit. I feel obviously, you know, much better about myself now and I know what I can accomplish. But at the beginning, selling people on what I could do was difficult for me. You know, like I said, you're the everything. You're running the business. You're the salesperson, artist. You're you're conceptualizing, coming up with drawings. The for marketing them. person. You're the marketing person, yeah. and then you're the person making the piece. You know, there's all these things you have to figure out, engineering how you're going to build it, and then if you're building, you know, like say a gate or something, you know, how am I going to install it? How is this going to function at their piece of property? So right. there's all kinds of things that you know you might not think about, and I I just wish I would have been better at the beginning of that, but I learned as I went along. But a lot of those things, I think, you almost have to live it True. to find all those little pieces that you might need. I mean, even if you thought ahead of time, I don't know if you would think of all of those no, things. No, you no. Know? There's there's a lot of stuff that you, you're right. And once you've gone through it a few times, then you, you learn start really to quick. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You start to learn like, oh, I didn't, I didn't do this last time. I got to do this better this time. Yeah. You, know? you start realizing that you have to become an expert in like a numerous field in finishes in installation and in, you know, all the things that are out there, you know, that you might need Mm -hmm. to do these things. And so you don't just have to be an expert in the blacksmithing end of it itself. Right. It's, it's figuring the rest of it out too. Business end and making sure that the thing you're selling, that the price you're selling it for, you're going to make money out. And how many hours will it take? And you don't know until you actually do it. That's right. You know, at the the beginning and everyone will tell you this, that does this, like there were numerous projects that I did that I just lost because you just don't know, you know, you don't know exactly what you're getting into. And obviously getting close to 20, years in, I have a much firmer grasp on that now. Sure. Well, um, and, and so your technique has also improved absolutely. greatly. All of those pieces. Sure. And then you know, I have more equipment. I mean, everything is better now, yes. you know, than it yes. was. But but it's still, it's learning, like when you do a drawing, like to be able to look at it and say, what's this going to take me to build it? Mm-hmm. Being realistic with yourself, time and the time wise yeah. and, you know, and the client too, yeah. you know, like yeah. this is what this is going to take to do this. To have a little bit better grasp on the business end of it mm-hmm. would have been nice at the beginning. Are you looking back? Are you glad that you did it, that you took the leap and you started your own business? Absolutely. It's been enjoyable. I work a lot. Going back, you know, when you run your own business, you're everything. I mean, I work long days. Um, you know, I get up very you early in the really morning. You work really long days. <laughs> I, get up, I get up early in the morning. I'm usually up at uh, 5 o'clock or before, and I go right to my shop, and I work until 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night sometimes, depending wow. on how much we have. But you have to get done what's there. But you got to love that. I, I do. mean, there is no clocking in, clocking out. You're That's always right. doing something. That's it. If you're not actually making the product, you're looking for the next project, or you're doing the marketing. It's just always something. There's, there's always something. But to do. you got to love it to get up at before five in the morning I, and be there and spend I love, all day. I love my life. Luckily, you know, like my wife has been super supportive. Of me. And that's um, really important too. She's been my biggest proponent, a huge help. If it wasn't for her, I don't know that I would have gotten to this point. She deserves a ton of credit. She's put up with a lot. You know, when you run your own business, there's lean times and it gets hard. But, you know, we've come a long way and she's been a great partner in all of it. And that's a, that really is important because Huge. during those times that are, are a little lean, your first thought is, should I be doing this? Point. I certainly have been at that point before yeah. where I've wondered, like, is, is am I doing the right thing here? But I'm happy that we have stuck with it. My interview with Andrew Chambers was going to be a 30-minute podcast on trades. But our conversation took so many different directions. 
I just couldn't end the podcast at 30 minutes, so I decided to turn it into a two-part series. If you're a parent who has a child interested in a trade, or you yourself are interested in pursuing a trade out of high school, then you will want to hear the advice Andrew gives parents and kids alike. I hope you continue to listen to part two and enjoy it as much as I did taping it. Thank you again for listening to Sharp HR Career Corner. Please support this podcast by sharing, liking, and leaving us a comment.